This show has been brought to you by Smith's Detection and the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. My voice is the voice that guides you home safely each and every day. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I am the voice of the safest and most efficient airspace in the world. I have to be 100%, 100% of the time. I am. I am. I am. I am a professional air traffic controller. Hi, I'm Justin Tolles, and welcome to another edition of One on One. Uh, today we want to talk about small unmanned aircraft systems and specifically the proposed rule that the FAA published just last week. So today I'm joined with Aaron Greenwald of the Unmanned Safety Institute. And uh, how are you doing today, Aaron? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Justin. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the Unmanned Safety Institute and your role in the UAS industry. Uh, sure. Uh, so the Unmanned Safety Institute was kind of born out of this idea that we can serve public organizations and commercial enterprises and assist them uh, in the best way possible to safely integrate UAS into the national airspace uh, and also operate responsibly. And so our core focus is really divided into three key segments. And so we're focused on human factors, and that would be pilot training and qualification standards. Um, we're focused on technology reliability, so flight testing and evaluation. And we're also focused on building safe organizations, and so building and developing safety management systems for large-scale commercial operations that are complex. Excellent. So as you know, kind of getting into the rule here a little bit, uh, FAA required Congress to create a comprehensive plan for integration of UAS into the National Aerospace System, or the NAS. Uh, so where does the publication of this draft uh, small UAS rule from last week kind of fit into the, uh, that plan, and what are the next steps in the goal towards widespread integration? So we know that the FAA's UAS roadmap is composed of three different phases. Mm -hmm. Phase one was accommodation, and that was basically factored on the development of these FAA official test sites, uses platforms for research and development, uh, as well as the Section 3 through 3 process, which is uh, where commercial organizations can seek petitions for waivers to operate until this final rule is published. Uh, phase two is actually integration, and that is where the, the draft rule and final rule will be placed. Uh, phase three will eventually be uh, more complex operations that are designed uh, to evolve with the advancement of technology both for the NAS and for UAS as well. And in that specific regard, we're talking about beyond line of sight operations. Gotcha. Okay, excellent. So obviously this rule was a pretty hefty one, over a little over 150 pages. Uh, so could you maybe outline some of the key points addressed in, uh, in the proposal for us, um, specifically any that you might think of um, be of spe specific interest to uh, either airport operators or pilots? Absolutely. So uh, within this uh, proposed rule, the FAA is seeking to uh, integrate Part 107, which will specifically address UAS operations for small aircraft. Uh, and in this, UAS will be able to operate uh, without ATC approval in Class G airspace. What's surprising to us is that UAS will also be able to operate in Class B, C, and D airspace, and as well as in the limitation boundaries of Class E airspace with ATC approval. Uh, we're also kind of surprised to learn that UAS will be authorized to operate within the boundaries of five miles of all airports um, with ATC approval and the knowledge of the airport operator. Um, and so that presents uh, some challenging flight safety implications for both the manned aircraft in the air traffic corridor as well as the UAS platforms as well. Understandable. Um, so I think we kind of mentioned a few, uh, but are, especially with the uh, operations being allowed in the Class B, C, and D airspace and also operations allowed within five miles of the airport. But is there anything else uh, that was included in the proposed rule that kind of surprised you or that you know surprised some other UAS uh, industry experts? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that really kind of took us by surprise were that there's no airworthiness certification yeah. requirement for the UAS. And so um, it, it appears through the draft rule that there will be pre-flight inspection requirements uh, for the platform itself. Uh, and the operator will be subject to uh, provide that platform to the FAA for inspection uh, at any time. However, uh, as, we, as, as we have assessed, you know, there's, a, there's a big difference between a platform that's five pounds 
um, and battery powered and uh, 55 pounds and contains com combustible fuel. And so factoring in airworthiness certifications and requirements uh, for those larger systems that are operating in more complex environments uh, is something that is potentially very significant. Interesting. So now a lot of our members are involved in one way or another with a lot of the test sites, you know, the six test sites throughout the uh, the U.S. So the airworthiness um, kind of a section of the the rule, uh, you know, that that might be of some interest because I think that was potential, you know, uh, uses for the test sites. So how do you think, you know, not requiring an airworthiness certificate may affect the test sites? Sure. Well, so. We understand that the FAA has uh, proposed this, this rule that will not require airworthiness uh, because of the pace of technology and evolution okay. in technology. And so they don't want to stymie uh, entrepreneurship or technology evolution, uh, especially with regards to this emerging uh, industry and the technology promise that this holds. Um, that being said, within these official FAA test sites, there are designated airworthiness representatives. And so their task uh, and their authorization is to provide special airworthiness certificates um, in the restricted or experimental categories for UAS to conduct flight test and evaluation. Uh, presumably that data would then be shared with the FAA and hopefully uh, that data can then be used to help them develop their phase three approach. Uh, so perhaps more complex operations with regard to beyond line of sight um, or riskier operations. Excellent. Well, that's a good segue. You talked about line of sight. There seems to be a lot of questions and very strong opinions from a lot about <coughs> that line of sight requirement, which was, a, which was included in the proposal. Um, kind of what are your feelings on this? And you know, do you believe there's uh, any possibility that FAA may kind of change directions um, with this requirement uh, before the publication of this final rule? We know that you know, there's been some discussion um, in some of the, uh, the information put out by FAA. They specifically asked for comments about the line of sight, mm -hmm. whether that requirement you know, should expand, uh, and if so, what are the, the provisions there? And then, of course, we've also heard some, some push from Capitol Hill, specifically Senator Schumer, which sent a letter to, uh, to FAA basically saying, you know, to, to allow you know, outside of line of sight operations. So, you know, what are your feelings on this? Where do you think we're going? So we know that uh, in the FAA's draft rule, visual, visual observer is not required. Uh, we also know that if a pilot uses a visual observer, they cannot actually daisy chain visual, line, uh, visual observers to create uh, an expanded range for the UAS. Uh, we think that in phase two, so integration of the UAS in the near term, a visual line of sight will remain a, a key component. Okay. Um, however, in this draft rule, there is uh, language that indicates that the FAA is actively looking at specific uh, commercial applications that pose minimal risk to, to public safety and, of course, no risk to national security. Um, and so perhaps in those, in those applications, we may see uh, an exemption to the direct visual line of sight requirement. Um, and I, I think a good example might be uh, agriculture applications um, in, in rural areas of America. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, so there's also been discussion about uh, geofencing technology for UAS as well. Uh, we've had several incidents recently um, that have kind of caught the public attention. One, a you know, small UAS flying onto the White House lawn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also operations within TFRs. Um, and you know, there's been some... Um, some incidents of UAS being over, you know, over large venues such as stadiums and, and things of that nature. So there's a requirement in the rule that you know that wouldn't be allowed to happen. But there is some discussion about you know should manufacturers be required to place geofencing technology in their UAS that prevent you know th that's a hard stop you know um, that would prevent this from happening. Do you think that's you know w w is the technology there for that? And if so, you know is that an application that would uh, improve safety? And is that something that that we should look into. Sure. Well, um, so an important distinction between uh, different types of platforms. So we have open source software platforms and closed source software platforms. And so um, both software platforms within UAS aircraft may be susceptible to certain uh, certain nefarious behavior by nefarious actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, that being said, the actual technology we believe is quite mature, where geofencing would prevent uh, aircraft from from entering restricted areas. Uh, we do know in the FAA's draft rule that they did actually consider um, implementing a flight termination technology, uh, geofencing, where aircraft would be uh, kind of guided and, and protected from entering restricted airspace or restricted areas, um, but they did not proceed with that. And so the FAA is taking an approach. Uh, that they term performance-based operator responsibility standard. And basically what that means from the FAA's perspective is that they're going to rely on the operator who will be trained and certified by the FAA uh, or an FAA-designated test site um, to 
develop physical parameter and boundaries for the operations. And so that will act as a perimeter uh, to essentially geofence the area of operation. Um, but with that being said, there is no specific uh, imperative at this current time to implement a geofencing technology. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, so one other thing that, that you know, was of interest of some of our members as well um, that just came to mind is the, so a lot of people are expecting uh, the requirement of having a pilot certificate in order to operate a UAS. So that was not included in the rule, but there is um, going to be some requirements for operators and training and so forth. Would you mind outlining some of, you know, what that might look like? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, so yeah, so right. So initially we were thinking that maybe potentially this baseline requirement for the operation of UAS would be a private pilot's license. Um, it, as it turns out, the FAA will now be issuing an unmanned operator certificate, um, and the, the, requ the requirements for that will be a minimum age of 17 years old, uh, ability to pass an uh, aeronautical skills test that can be administered by an FAA-designated uh, uh, testing location. Um, and so within that, there will be uh, a variety of different types of, of knowledge-based testing that will take place, and that will address things like airport operations, uh, system limits, uh, system performance and limitations, um, as well as um, aeronautical decision making, uh, weather, uh, and other factors that are really going to be critical to the safe operation of UAS, but not necessarily something where this is uh, essential to the operation of a manned aircraft. Gotcha. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, so <clears throat> I think we've hit a, you know, a lot of the, the key points um, you know, for the benefit of everyone watching. But in closing, you know, what thoughts or advice do you, would you like to share with some of our members regarding the UAS industry, um, you know, kind of where it's heading in the coming years, and what airports should be considering as we approach the wide-scale full integration of UAS into the NAS that we were talking about? Sure, absolutely. Well, so, um, of course, we see tremendous uh, benefit to this technology, and, and we would like to see uh, its integration into the NAS uh, be accelerated as quickly as possible, uh, but also done safely and responsibly. Um, airport operations and the implications to manned aircraft operations are very severe um, and so uh, we want to take an approach that really balances flight safety with bringing this technology uh, for the betterment of society. Um, one thing that we've identified that could really benefit airports um, are the commercial application for their own uh, use and so uh, a few different areas that kind of come to mind would be perhaps wildlife management yeah. uh, or even perimeter control of the of the airport using uh, you know even a visual line of sight a small system. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate Great. that. As you know very well, and you're uh, active with, uh, with our conference that we held on UAS um, out at the uh, Reno Tahoe Airport, um, AAA is trying to, uh, has been very engaged on the issue, and we like to continue that. And uh, we hope to uh, continue to have your support and help as we, as we move forward. And also, for any members who are interested in getting involved in this issue, uh, the UAS Working Group, uh, led by Dean Schultz of Reno Tahoe and Jeremy Wall of Alaska uh, DOT, uh, are leading. Uh, that group, which will be drafting comments uh, for this uh, small UAS rule, which are due 60 days from the publication. Uh, you know, th that group is part of the Operation Safety Planning and Emergency Management Committee. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved in that process, uh, feel free to give, uh, give me a call or sh shoot me an email, and we'll be sure to get you involved. Again, Aaron, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll uh, love to have you back at some point to kind of talk about this as it develops further. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.